It being 633, I'll call the monthly meeting of GFW School Board to order. Uh, first order on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Does anyone have any additions or corrections? If not, is there a motion to approve the agenda as printed? Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's made and seconded to approve the agenda. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. Um, visitor recognition, we've got the press here tonight. I know we've got a lot of people on, on video. Welcome to everyone. Um, moving right along into superintendent's report. All right, uh, thank you, Chair Keen. Uh, really excited to have a few things to share with our uh, board and our uh, community this evening. First, what we wanna start out with is some of the work we'll be doing with Southwest West Central Service Co-op. Um, we started something this year called our big four meetings and we've been able to access resources from the regional centers of excellence the regional centers of excellence is a uh, group of it's a team of people that was that was set aside i shouldn't say set aside they were developed uh in conjunction with mde as kind of a subgroup to regionally support schools who had especially been identified under um essa the every student succeeds act that is the legislation that replaced no child left behind um, we were able to access their resources uh, because we do have one identified school uh, when they did their initial round of identification. And they have been here to help transition and support some of our um, teaching and learning practices and take us through some pieces. So we've been doing a lot of uh, work here. Our big four groups are aligned to our strategic plan around student achievement. And that's where they're really focusing. Uh, in particular, one thing we're talking about is a multi-tiered systems of support. What that means is that we have uh, a tier one for all students. That's 80% of your students are getting things in the core classes. Uh, and then there's those students that need a second scoop. There's about 15% of students that need that. That's like our interventionists in math and reading and social emotional learning. Um, and then there's another scoop on top of that, which is more um, intense interventions, which is getting to really very small groups or even to one-on-one -on -one special education pieces. So developing those resources and to make sense of that system so students and staff understand how that flows and coordinating all that, it takes a lot of work. And so they've been working with our teams in those uh, some of the Wednesday meetings we've had and through some of our professional development learning opportunities. So that is one component of that. Um, part of MTSS, and that's what um, Lisa Gregori, our, the Director of Teaching and Learning from South, uh, Southwest West Central Service Co-op and Aaron Jacobson, uh, who is an instructional coach and a grant leader with uh, SWWC, are gonna be here to talk about this evening. Um, and they're gonna share a little bit about professional learning communities. Uh, we have professional learning communities here at GFW and we are part of a, a national grant. And they're gonna share a little bit about that and the work that they're doing to help move um, our staff forward to help our students learn and um, really to be in alignment with best practices. So um, uh, Aaron and Lisa, uh, would you like to take it away? Sure, thank you, Jeff. Um, do I have the capability to share my screen? I believe you do, go ahead and give it a shot. And for those in the room, we have a, a big TV, so they'll be able to see everything that you have there. Super, You, okay. you got it. Thanks. Well, thanks for having us. Um, GFW School Board, uh, we appreciate the time. We love to talk about the work that we do and, and how we can support schools. So happy to be here on this blustery winter February night. Um, just to give you a little background, Southwest West Central Service Co-op started partnering with New Teacher Center, which is a um, national uh, organization that supports not only um, instructional coaching, but mentoring, induction, school leadership, um, a variety of school related um, support services. And about four years ago when we started the work, um, we're still fairly young in our, in our regional program, but uh, we do have a leadership team. We have had three cohorts of instructional coaches um, go through, it's a, it's a two year training. Um, and I'm gonna use the word instructional coach with a lot of flexibility because we not, we have not only had um, individuals go through that are still in the classroom and doing some instructional coaching, but we've also had administrators go through the training. We've had curriculum directors, we've had EL coordinators, 
Um, so we've had a variety that have taken that learning and applied it across many, many um, programs within their in their um, districts in order to see some systematic change. So working with the leadership team, we came up with this mission for our region. And I think because of the uniqueness of our program across the nation, um, because it's a consortium model, SWWC coordinates and, and leads the program. However, the districts have the flexibility um, to, to implement what best meets their needs um, back at their districts. Um, and then also we provide support for our federal setting for programs, which I think also makes us very unique. And I think for those reasons, we were asked to partner in this um, national grant uh, that, is, that is being led by the U United States Department of Education with New Teacher Center and SRI, who would be the <clears throat> evaluator partner within the grant. And they're called Education Innovation and Research Grants. The focus of this one is around meeting um, social and emotional learning needs in order to better um, improve student success and achievement. As Jeff mentioned, we have a grant team. Um, I, I'm overseeing the grant work. And then Aaron is our, our lead grant coach, um, instructional coach, who also had gone through the our regional cohort one training with New Teacher Center. So I'll let Erin go ahead and introduce herself. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> so I'm Erin Jacobson and um, GFW is uh, very near and dear to my heart as I was a elementary teacher there for 15 years and four years as an instructional coach, as Lisa mentioned. I also went through um, the training, which was um, I was very fortunate to do. Um, and then <clears throat> also I still have two children that are in GFW and my husband is currently um, a high school teacher there too. So um, like I said, this is uh, a great thing for the school district and I couldn't be more excited. Thanks, Erin. And then Jen Yacovino is our program consultant from New Teacher Center and she's actually located in Minnesota, which isn't always the case with New Teacher Center. Um, Program consultants, they're all over the nation. So uh, they support many programs across the nation. So we're fortunate to have her um, in, uh, I think she comes out of South Minneapolis. So just to give you a little background, this is New Teacher Center's vision and mission. They really um, focus on putting students at the center of all the work, what's best for kids. And, and through that work, making sure it's, it's equitable and really thinking about it systematically. So I'll give you just a couple of seconds to run your eyes over that. And then just to give you a little bit of background around the evolution of the new teacher center. Um, it's really about job embedded professional development, supporting educators so that they can in turn better support students and meet their needs. We say there's 100% of learner variability in every classroom. And when you think about that, that's very complex and challenging for educa educators, especially new educators to meet. Um, all those learning needs of, of students. So that's really at the essence of our, of our work. And then to tie that work together with, with our priorities and the grant goals, um, and hopefully you're able to read that with, with the different coloring. I just noticed that now that maybe the color doesn't show up the best for you over there. But um, again, really focusing on those students' social and emotional learning needs, um, educator collaboration, our work has also led to retention and development and also recruitment of, of teachers in our regional districts could um, support all those statements. They've all seen changes in, in their work related to that. And then really about increasing that teacher effectiveness so that we can have a impact on student outcomes. Um, new Teacher Center's model is evidence-based and Aaron's gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes but really at the foundation of our work and really the overarching goal of our work at the same time is what we call 
<clears throat> excuse me, the optimal learning environment. And these are the three domains of that optimal learning environment. We know that we need to create emotionally and textually, <clears throat> intellectually and physically safe environments so that students are ready to learn and engage in the content. Um, and then really thinking about those equitable, culturally responsive um, strategies to meet the standards that, that the state has asked us to meet, and then meeting those diverse needs of every learner. And there are, there are rubrics uh, rubric with indicators um, to break down each of these domains. And as GFW gets deeper into the work, um, they'll get deeper into those indicators as well. I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk a little bit about the, the evidence-based model that we work with when we work within the uh, new teacher centers framework. So first of all, I want to just start out a little bit by talking about that um, this is not a curriculum. So GFW is not purchasing a curriculum, but rather that um, what we're helping GFW do and the AR grant schools do is to <clears throat> develop a systems level approach to doing what's best for students and supporting teachers and making the necessary changes so that um, our students will grow. And also with the goal of building sustainability within the walls of GFW. And so you can kind of see this graphic talks about, um, you know, the, the students are right there at the center, but there are multiple stakeholders that are involved with this process as well. And so we are going to be working with GFW to build the capacity of your teachers and your teacher leaders and the administrators there so that you can sustain um, this type of work in years to come. So Lisa mentioned that there were some high leverage tools that the instructional coaches or those uh, teachers or support staff that GFW has identified to go through the instructional coaching training. But this, these are evidence-based practices and these tools are what those people would be using in order to enhance the instruction in the classroom. And um, so that they have also the support that they need from the coach in order to um, make gains. So we talked a little bit um, about the impact. Um, Lisa, I, I, could we just skip to the next slide quick? That might make a little bit more sense and then come back to that one. Um, and NTC's impact on months of additional learning. So students that were taught by teachers who were supported by NTC trained coaches or facilitators gained up to an additional five months of learning. That's pretty impressive when you think about um, just the nine months that our, teach, our, our students are in school. But SRI International is the outside source that did the um, research evaluation on this, who um, will also be doing the tripod um, evaluation research as well that Lisa will talk about later. But you can see here that there were two to five months of additional um, learning in math and um, an additional two to four months of additional learning in ELA for those teachers who were supported by um, NTC trained staff which would be your staff <laughs> that's going to be going through the, the training. But this impact here, it talks about on the left that up to five months of additional learning for students in those math and reading areas. And then also the impact is the change in practice. So we want to support teachers uh, to change practices that are more evidence-based so that we get the best outcome that we possibly can. And then also, of course, 22% um, increase of retention in teachers of those school districts who are supported um, by NTC trained teachers. And we know right now that um, getting teachers in education is, um, is, is becoming a little bit of a crisis. And so we wanna make sure that we have good um, programs that support our teachers so that we can retain them. Ms. Jacobson, can I ask you a question? Yes. This is a, uh, you talked about data with this. What types of data are you looking at? I know there's five, those five types of data out there. Can you, can you share a little bit about that? Um, and, and the five types of which data? Can you be a little bit? Like, on, there's, on the, there's, like there's student achievement data, perception data, fidelity data, and different pieces. It looks like you have a lot of measures that you're using. So this is something we can measure the impact. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how we'll be able to see how this impacts our district. Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about that? she's might have a little bit more background with that tripod. Uh, 
Sure. So this would be student achievement data. So if, say if they're doing this in Minnesota, which we will be doing, um, they would look at the MCA data from the state because that's what SRI will have access to. They're not going to be able to have that um, identified student level data necessarily, but they know which grades that we're supporting. And so they will um, work with the state of Minnesota to look at that in in um, conjunction with the tripod um, results, which we'll talk about in a second too. The other, in some of the research that New Teacher Center has done, they've also used Danielson's framework and they've identified indicators across those domains, um, if you're familiar with that. And, and they probably just, they do probably some walkthrough to collect data um, and they'd come up with different ways that they'd want to monitor that and, and collect that. Um, which is not one of the things that we're doing in this particular um, grant. It'll be student achievement data, which will be MCA, because that's that's the state assessment. And that's why the focus of the grant is also on grades three through eight. And although we can still support grades um, K through 12, it's just that the data is going to get pulled in three through eight. Does, does that help? That does. Thank you very much. And we do use the Danielson framework in our district. Yeah, and there's also been a crosswalk done between Danielson framework and the optimal learning environment. So always, I'm happy to share that with you um, if you think that would be a valuable resource for your school as well. Thank you. So, so this slide is just basically showing that in a particular school before NTC um, <clears throat> instructional coaches were supporting teachers, there's a 72% um, retention rate, and then it jumped to a 94% retention rate. And so <clears throat> we know that supported teachers in the classroom, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or PLCs, which uh, GFW has chosen for um, us to help support in that um, model, that we know that these tools that we talked about previously can and will be used in the PLC settings to in increase teachers' capacity, so therefore our students can, can um, grow as well. And we don't, this isn't gonna show up in any data report card, but our regional schools would tell you um, after implementing now for three years that one of our biggest districts that's participating hired the least amount of teachers this past school year um, because now they are three years into, into the program. They're able to keep those teachers because they're supporting them. And we've also had schools tell us that they've offered an education opening to a candidate. The candidate had multiple job offers, um, as you can imagine with, with the shortage in teachers, and they chose their district because they knew that they were gonna get support through this model. So I, those are just you know anecdotal data, but I mean, those are the stories that we really need to tell some of the success that we're seeing in, in, the, in the program. So um, we mentioned, this is, a, this is part of a grant. It's, it's a federal research study grant. And with that comes the data collection. And then I um, also want to mention that there was a randomization process that took place as well, um, because they wanna see the impact of the implementation of not only the evidence-based framework, but the SEL strategies that we're gonna pull into this work um, and help support schools around to see what the impact is between what we call treatment schools and delayed schools. And I know those terms are awful. <laughs> we were talking to a principal yesterday that's in a delayed school, which means they don't receive all the support until 2024. Um, he said he was on the waiting list is how he put it. And I thought that was putting it much nicer. So um, students in grades three through eight are given the tripod survey and SRI, the research partner in the grant administers that and works with the school on that. So we don't work as closely. Um, we, we try to help support the schools get set up for that. And it's around, um, they call them the seven C's. However, students were only asked survey questions around these first six C's. Just because the classroom management piece, new teacher center's philosophy didn't quite align with that. So they, they wanted to leave that one out. So it aligns better with, with their beliefs around students advocating um, for their needs within the classroom and things like that. So that's not to say that classroom management isn't important. Um, we know that it is in education, but 
just so you know that that's that was um, only six out of the seven C's were given. And that window just closed February 11th. So um, schools will re be receiving um, both school reports and grade level reports. Um, and then we'll help them reflect and analyze on that on that data. And that will help inform our work going forward as well. And that will be given several times throughout the life of the grant. And this is a five-year um, research grant. These these are the questions that went into the grant application to the, U, to the U.S. Department of Education and that we are trying to answer through our grant work. So, and I'm happy to provide any of these and all of these slides to you following the meeting, um, but wanted to build some context for you first. So I'll let you run your eyes over those. Can you share for those listening what ELA stands for and uh, SEL stands for? Absolutely. Um, so SEL would be social and emotional learning. ELA is going to be English language arts. Yeah, I know a lot of acronyms, right? Um, and let's see, I think instructional coaching, they had that one right away. So in GFW's case, you can substitute instructional coaching with PLC facilitator. Um, we just use instructional coaching, like I said, with some flexibility and we're, we just use it interchangeable with, with the role that um, those educators will play within the district. Um, there's a couple ways you can implement. You can implement in a one-to-one -one model. Um, so a facilitator or coach to one teacher and, um, or you can do it through your PLCs, which I think is a more efficient model probably for our rural schools because you have that time already carved out and you have that structure in place and you're able to reach more educators probably in a shorter amount of time than the one-to-one -one model. They're both good or you can choose to do a hybrid model as you see fit. Um, Jeff mentioned the PLC foundations. Um, we we are going to be offering this. It's a three, three and a half hour kind of high level overview of best practices um, in PLCs for GFW on March 24th. Um, they had a smaller team that was able to do it virtually um, a while back, but we're gonna do it in person for all staff so that everybody's hearing the same message. And I will share with you, here's the outcomes of our time together on March 24th. Aligned to this work, there's what we call an effective PLCs continuum. Again, it's a, it's a rubric and um, GFW staff will have the opportunity to um, express where they feel their PLC that they're participating in falls on that continuum. There's four domains that make up that continuum. So we'll take that as baseline data and we'll use that data to really customize that morning for GFW staff. Um, depending on which domains kind of come out as areas that maybe they feel like they need more growth in. And then we'll also um, would like to, you know, facilitate that same survey down the road to see if there's growth in the PLCs. And then we just, we also, as part of that day, I mean, there's, as you know, PLCs, you know, have, have a lot of benefits to them if they're implemented with fidelity. Um, in, we put this structure in place to get to an outcome. And what we do within that structure to get to that outcome really matters. So that's really kind of the heart of, of what we'll be um, sharing that day. And then just briefly, I wanted to share with you a timeline. And this timeline is actually for treatment schools. So GFW Elementary would be the treatment school. So we have been supporting them um, since the beginning of the school year. We've also been supporting the secondary as much as we can although the secondary ended up as the delayed or on the wait list um, of schools. But PLC Foundations is for everybody um, 
The tripod survey is administered to both treatment and delayed, delayed schools. Um, the student achievement data will get will get pulled for grades three through eight again, so that we can see if there's impact to this work after after several years. So we will be working and supporting the treatment schools through June of, of 2023. At that time, we would love for them to be part of our regional program so we can continue to support them and we can grow that network. Um, we just had our first two cohorts in for the regional program last week and the energy and the enthusiasm around this work was off the charts. You just, your bucket is just filled when those people come back together. They're so passionate about this work. And I just think how fortunate those districts are to have teachers and students being supported by some of those individuals. So, and that's why we do what we do is to, is to really do what's best for kids and see the results of that work. So it's been really exciting. A lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, appreciate your time. If you have questions, we, we can stick around and answer questions. Um, if, if you kind of have the information that you, you're okay with at this point, we're always happy to come back at another point to, to share some updates, but you tell us. Aaron, I have a question. Uh, Mike Keen, would this take FaceTime away from teachers and students or would this training be done during staff development days? The PLC foundations, um, that the, the training for all staff would um, be done during um, their professional learning days. Yep. And then um, in the summertime, we will have a couple days where those individuals who have been selected by GFW, which is your, your interventionist right now, your treatment schools. So there's, there's three people and then any additional um, administrators, <clears throat> um, Jeff or Jennifer, that want to jump in on that training in the summertime. Um, they most definitely can, um, but we also, Lisa and I will also be um, just working with schools and what is the best time for those um, selected individuals um, at the elementary school to work with in their schedule. So no teachers will be brought out of their classroom. Uh, we'll just be directly working with your interventionists who have been chosen for um, this work. Any other questions? Uh, Aaron and Lisa, if you could stick around for a second too, just for a little bit, you might have a little bit more to chime in about. I really appreciate the cross coordination you've done with the regional centers of excellence staff. Um, there has been a lot of crosswalking they've been doing to say, okay, how does all this fit together? And that has been really helpful, I think. So we know what the left shoe knows what the right shoe is doing and how this all lines into that student achievement work that they're doing with us. And it is all coming together. And another piece of that is um, the curriculum review process that we're going through and the standards alignment. And um, as it, it's Karen Schulte, am I saying it correctly? Karen Schulte from Southwest West Central will be working with us to work on um, our standards and our curriculum purchases. We have not, uh, we have not purchased curriculum in a very long time in our district, and we are well beyond where we need to be with that. So one of the things that we have um, are doing as part of this process is we need to make sure we're reviewing what standards work has been done by our staff and some work has been done. We need to probably take that a little bit further before we go out and buy all the curriculum to make sure it aligns. Standards go through a review process every so many years, and some of those processes have happened. So. Um, do you, is there anything that either of you'd like to share about that curriculum review process? And, we, and we've penciled in about a year and a half that's going to take us to go through that entire process before we finally get the curriculum in our hands because of the work we have to do um, to get to that point. Yeah, I think having a strong you know, process and a cycle in place, I mean, that, that, that's critical. And I think we, we saw over the last you know, two years during the pandemic, some of that stuff kind of went off to the side. And even the Department of Ed the brakes on some of the implementation um, of the of the standards work as well. We've had some staff at SWWC, our education consultants, that have a lot of experience in this. And I don't think people realize the amount of time it takes to review, select, implement, um, 
new curriculum that also aligns to Minnesota standards. So I think, you know, we can take a lot of that legwork and take on a leadership role there to help out your staff, because otherwise it, it does fall on a staff member or principal's plate. And, and one of the core things in professional learning communities, the work you're doing is standards, right? It's what are, that's the first question we ask is what are the big ideas or standards we want to be focusing on? So that work should tie into our curriculum process, correct? Yeah, I mean, you want student work and, and data and, you know, standards and just meeting all students' needs to really be at the heart of that PLC work. Um, so, yeah, we will help and we'll continue to help align, you know, so it doesn't feel like, you know, there's a lot of different things going on, but how they really all come together and everything is pointing towards the same outcome. And as we implement that MTSS framework I mentioned at the beginning with the regional centers of excellence, at the core level, we want to know if the students know the standard and then what do we do if they do already know it or if they don't know it. And if they don't know it, that's where we start talking about differentiations. We need an extra scoop. Um, how do we help all students learn? And how do we excel those students too who have already learned and they need that enrichment piece? So there's, So we've been talking about that going both ways. So it all does kind of tie together under that framework, but there's different components that we're, we're targeting in on. So as it starts to come together, it'll, it'll I, I, in my mind, I see a beautiful handbook that says, this is how we do this at GFW. So. Yes, so, so Jeff, just like you said, our, ours would be a little bit more on a micro level if we were helping the PLCs break down those standards. So maybe they're working on a particular thing in a grade level. Okay, let's look at that one or two. Um, standards and what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, what are your groupings? What is your, um, you know, your differentiating instruction look like in your classroom? How are we going to do this? Um, how long are we going to take to measure this? How are we going to measure this? So it's just someone there um, to support them in those processes and protocols so that we know that um, our students are um, learning the standards in that particular grade. Well, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate your time and just helping us all see kind of how that all is fitting together. And I know it's a journey to get there. It's not something you get done in a month or even a year. It's, it's a multi-year process. So, and it's a continuous improvement process, right? So thank you for that. And I just want to share with the board, we've, um, we've really enjoyed working with your staff. I've also had the opportunity to work with GFW in the past and I just, um, I, really, I really enjoy it. And I look forward to being able to continue to work with them over the next few years. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, moving on from student achievement in my report, um, another part of our strategic plan is uh, facilities. And we've been trying to determine, you know, what is it, how we can best go about meeting our community's needs with facilities. And so we have a, a team of people here today. Um, and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Sue Peterson start, and I think you can maybe do introductions from there if you'd like, Sue, unless you'd prefer me to do them, but um, I, I'm just gonna kind of turn it over to you and go from there. And you are muted, and I only see you in the meeting once, so uh, do we need to send... Can you hear me now? We, we can hear you now. Um, I don't know if you okay. saw, but Gary held up a sign for you in all his glory. Um. <laughs> oh, you are <laughs> the good old fashioned way. Well, I said, thanks for letting um, all of us join you virtually. I think we're all living in places that have um, bad weather right now. So we appreciate that. Um, Jeff, I think I'll let you run around the horn if you want and uh, um, introduce the rest of the team, and then I'll jump into the work that we've been doing together. Absolutely. So uh, we'll go ahead and start. Um, we can start with uh, Mr. Mike Hoheisel. Do you want to start by introducing yourself? Hi, my name is Mike Kohweisel. I helped you guys at the operating levy, and I'm part of the finance team as the underwriter for Baird. Uh, and uh, nice to see you all again. And uh, 
I will uh, mute and let Sue take the show. All right, uh, next we have Michael Hart. Good evening, everyone. Michael Hart at PMA. I was just with you a couple months back. We're part of the finance team as well, financial advisor for the district. And Mr. Steve Pumper. Good evening, everyone. Steve Pumper with PMA Financial. I work with Michael Hart and part of the finance team. And we have uh, Mr. Gary Benson. Good evening, everyone. Gary Benson with Kraus Anderson. We're happy to be a part of your planning and pre-referendum team and looking forward to the project moving ahead, whatever it might be. Happy to be aboard. Uh, and then I don't see anybody else that's uh, might need so. All right. And then and Sue Peterson, I'll let you introduce yourself. All right, back to me. Yep, yeah, but I'm Sue Peterson. I'm with ISG Architects. So um, I too have been helping the group kind of move through a strategic planning process as you consider um, what type of referendum you would go out for as far as how best to address your facility needs. I believe you've got a paper survey in front of them. I'll also put it up on the screen. But the work that we've done um, thus far has really been to say, okay, um, you know, we know that you have a lot of needs. Um, we know that um, you've tried before and haven't found success. And so now we wanna walk through a process where we educate your community on really the needs of the district and then give them some options of how do you want us to solve this? And so utilizing a community survey tool will allow us to provide you, um, the district decision makers, with some good statistical data of what likely is going to have success at the polls. So again, um, it's a hefty document. There's a lot of information in there. It's designed very intentional to really tell a story. So to walk people through a process um, where first we're going to you know, tell kind of some good news and, and the goals of the district and then that planning background on um, how did we get to the point of knowing that we need to make a large investment in the schools. And then we've got a couple of options. So a turn right or turn left as far as what we would build um, the fact that we could add some additional features if people think they're important. And then finally, what it all comes down to, which is money. So how much of a tax increase are you willing to support to allow the district to address their facility needs? And so when we do all of that and we ask people who are taking the survey to tell us a bit about themselves, we're able to then dissect and slice and dice that data in a lot of different ways to be able to say, what do we know about folks that go to the polls? And so we can correlate that with voting habits and some other formulas that we use. And like I said, we'll be able to tell you with a high degree of predictability on um, what route we would advise the district to take. So I don't wanna spend um, several hours reading through this line by line. Um, our team has really spent a lot of time on this, but you know, this is going to get mailed out to all of your um, residents within the district. It'll come in the mail, kind of like a, a little mini uh, magazine. So think of 211 by 17 pieces of paper, um, printed front, back, center, stapled. So uh, like a, an eight page Sports Illustrated, if you will. And that cover letter is really intended to um, introduce uh, the setup of the district and kind of where you're at. So we talk about the fact that you've gotten your finances in order and that was a priority. You want to make sure that students are learning in a safe environment and that you've really spent some time going through a strategic planning process, as you also heard about earlier tonight, and have looked for new um, and needed um, educational opportunities for students. But in order to provide those great learning experiences for students, you need, um, you need to really look critically at your facilities and at your aging facilities. So really that opening letter is a setup of that such. Like I said, we're gonna ask people to tell us a bit about themselves that allows us to slice and dice the data in a variety of ways. And then we start to provide some background. So we're gonna talk about the condition 
of the building, give people some facts about the status of each of your building, the amount of money that would be needed to dump into those existing buildings to address some needs. Some would be things that need to be done right away. Others are things that need to be done at some point in the foreseeable future. So facility needs, then we want to look at student enrollment. So you've had a decline in enrollment. Um, the data shows that you're going to likely stabilize here and be dancing around that 700 student mark. Like I said, we then talked about the fact that you've added some new course offerings. And so you want to provide facilities that best meet students' learning needs. We also know, and you know, because you've gone out for a previous uh, referenda, that um, costs aren't going down or staying stable, that uh, the longer we put off addressing these needs, um, the more likely that things are going to cost more in the future. And so we want to acknowledge that, that um, you know, the needs of the district aren't going away. You also have some unique financial um, opportunities or benefits in doing this right now. And so we've provided some simple images to help, again, educate people on um, the district's current financial um, situation as it relates to a facility bond. Um, you'll soon be debt free, as you can see at the end of 2024. The district will be debt free. Um, you just got a few additional payments to make. You're also really benefiting from that Ag to School tax credit. So um, a significant benefit there with that 70% payable in 2023 and beyond. So we wanna make sure that those who own Ag land and all citizens understand that. And then finally, we know that interest rates remain low, certainly not as low as they've been, but interest rates are in a good place. So we asked questions in some places in the survey as really a reason for forcing people to make sure that they read the information. But we wanna get just a general sense of where folks are at as far as their general thought of, is now the time, You know, is this something that the district should be exploring to address their facility needs? And then you really have, um, you know, we've decided that at this point, we wanna talk about two basic options. So again, this is where we test information to see if we're in the right place. One option is that we uh, build a new pre-K-12 school. And so we've, you know, listed a few highlights of what that new school would include. And we're saying that to build an all new pre-K-12 school, would cost the district in including that land about $70 million. The other option is to scale that back at this point and say, let's build a 512 school. So we'll put our fifth through 12th graders in a new school. We've included a range there, so 48 to $52 million to um, do the 512. And you'd keep uh, your elementary school open for your pre-K through fourth grade students. We acknowledge that there are some things that will need to be tackled in the not so distant future at the elementary school. And so we're saying that that other option would be a cost of up to $55 million. Again, um, we can scale back some of the features in that 512. We would design that school for future addition of bringing those elementary school kiddos into that building, as well as making sure that it has the support spaces to meet the needs of all of the district at some point in the future. So again, critical updates at the elementary school, those could be done in phases over time, but the goal would be to look at taking that building offline, perhaps in seven to 10 years. Does it mean that in eight or nine years, you can't say we're gonna to continue to keep that building online and continue to make small investments? Certainly that's a possibility. But our goal was to try and provide two apples to apples um, comparisons as far as options. So we said option two would really cost about $55 million. And so we wanna see what people's appetites are for that. And we know that in addition to just building the school, the district has 
some other facility needs that um, could be addressed now or again at some point in the future. And so this is where I often talk to people about the fact that um, we all have we all have wishes and wants and we have needs. And so when we work on designing a strategy for the district, we say the need to have those go first, um, the nice to haves and certainly things that are important for kids academically and from a co-curricular standpoint and good for the district. But, you know, sometimes there's things that just we know may have to sit secondary um, just because of sheer cost and what people can um, are willing to support from a tax tolerance. So here we've said, all right, we've got some, some additional needs. Um, we know that your track and football field um, needs some love, and there's really two directions that could go, right? We could build all new at a cost of, we're saying $5.3 million, or we could make an investment in that, addition, that existing track and football field. We could build an auditorium onto the new school. So we've identified what the features of that could look like in a cost of $7.9 million. We know that a bus barn, a new bus barn would be valuable for the district to um, better shelter your fleet and allow for a place for maintenance at a cost of $4.5 million. And we know that there'd be, there's a desire from some to have a walking track and some additional community and school space in that new school. So many schools have a walking track that sits above the gym and some other spaces there that community and school can share. So we've put a cost to that. So what we do with these is we say to people, what do you think? Yes, no, unsure. And that allows us to rank order those and say, these are the things your community says um, are most important to them should there be enough money after that initial bill? Mm -hmm. And then it comes down to one thing, it always does, right? Life comes down to money. And so what we do is we try to build a tax tolerance and say, um, we let people know we're gonna give you various bond amounts. So we know that we could build a new 512 school for 50 million. Um, we could um, build the new school and address really what we're saying are those most critical updates at your elementary at 55 or that all new base pre-k 12 at 70 million we've thrown a few additional bond amounts in there because we knew that we asked about those bonus items right auditorium football field those things so we wanted to be able to um, measure those as well so we let people know based on the property or properties that you have and the values of those, here's the tax increase that they could expect in your district. In addition, um, there are some property tax relief um, funds out there. And so we wanted to educate people again on those so that there's some, some benefit for folks and, and that is income you know, your income eligible based on your income and then your the benefit is based on the value of your home. So complicated, certainly. So we simply provided um, an example for folks. And again, once we kind of move into and narrow into what bond amount we're going to um, go for, we'll certainly expand how we educate folks and that they can see what the benefit is to them. But what we knew was that um, a $100,000 residential property and a $60,000 annual household income were two pieces of data we had that looked like um, that would many people within the district could identify with that. So we chose three of those bond amounts to simply let people get an understanding of if I would qualify for this refund, the tax increase of various bond amounts would certainly be decreased. So we chose the 50, 55, and $70 million mark for folks to react to. And as I said, um, that property tax stuff is complicated. Part of it's based on what community you live in and that tax formula. So that's why we have the good folks, um, our financial partners with us to make sure we make sense of that. So we've provided that information to your citizens as well as a link where they can 
learn a bit more if they're curious at this point. But then really the most important question, we save the best for last, is we want folks to say to us, um, all right, based on the two tables where we've talked about the tax increases, we've explained the needs of the district, how much of a tax increase are you willing to accept? And so again, once folks answer that question and tell us a bit about themselves, we can then say with a high degree of predictability, here's your community's tax tolerance, as well as here's the direction of turn right or turn left that um, folks would like us to go. So that's kind of how the, how the project works. I will stop and take a breath and uh, let the other folks that were my partners, if any of them want to um, weigh in or add or comment. I know Gary Benson from Kraus Anderson is with us tonight. He may have some additional input as well. And then after um, we all weigh in, we can certainly answer any questions. Gary? Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and chime in a little bit. Um, we've had a lot of success on projects that in and around GFW that you probably recognize working with Sue and her group with the survey and the results we get from that. A notable one you may be familiar with, Maple River. Uh, that was a district just south of Mankato that that ended up with a new pre-K-12 as a matter of fact, but they, they failed three referendums before they finally, and I convinced them to do a survey and quit having the referendum be their survey. And they did a survey and followed that and were successful the fourth time and their new school is under construction. Um, Mountain Lake, not that far from you guys and Wyndham and Pipestone, Jackson County Central, all of them, uh, we worked with Sue on surveys on and, and gotten good reliable results and when the board and the district leadership have followed the recommendations they've been successful and we just think it's uh it's it's awesome that you're uh endorsing this and allowing this strategy to proceed to guide the facilities planning i think this will be the the element that really helps bring it along to a successful point for your district Michael Hart was part of Maple River as well in that strategizing with the finance part. So another welcome partner that you've got. You've got a very good team put together. Uh, Mike Holheisel and I have worked together many, many times on lots of K-12 projects and initiatives as well. Jeff. Um could you give us a little idea if we decide to go ahead with this survey, what the timeline it might be? So the survey would go out, it would go through some final review right now. So um, um, Sue Peterson's looking for some feedback, suggestions, some thoughts. She would take those, put those together. Uh, we would send that out to the community. The community would have uh, I want to say about a month, there'd be a paper version. Um, there'd be a, pr a paper version and there's also an online version that would go out to folks too. So we can send it out both ways. Um, but we'd want to make sure everybody gets it. Uh, we would be looking at doing a special board meeting. Um, I'm looking at my calendar. Early April. Yep. Yep. April. I thought it was the Oh, it is the fourth. Yep. April 4th would be a special board meeting to review the data. And um, at that time, uh, you can have a chance to consider the data. And then there would be, um, we'd have, I think, roughly a month, Gary, right? Correct. We have about a month before we'd have to make a decision once we get a chance to review that data. Yeah, um, we are suggesting, as, as the board knows from previous uh, referendum attempts, the, we have to do a review and comment submittal to the Department of Education for your proposal. And they get 60 days to review it. You need to publish the commissioner's letter 20 days at least before your vote date. And so backing up from August, from August 9th 
um, we need to be submitting first week of May to the Department of Ed, your review and comment proposal. We're suggesting, however, uh, as your planning partner on the team that with all the referendums that we know, there's a lot of pent up ones from last year that are going to be going this August. I've talked to the Department of Ed, they're expecting quite a number of them. And we would recommend we try to get your proposal in uh, no later than last week of April. So looking at somewhere around, you know, middle of April to April 20th, whenever the board meets to get uh, authorization to submit that. Now, from the legal standpoint and calling the ballot question the, or calling the election and developing the ballot question, that's 74 days prior, as, as, as Mike Holheisel would tell you. And I think that's, that's sometime later in May, um, but we'd suggest somewhere around middle of May that you need to be doing that. They don't have to go hand in hand, and the longer lead time is the review and comments. So getting that in is what's critical. So Sue, getting your results back really by somewhere around the end of March or 1st of April to report out publicly to the board and then giving the board a couple of weeks to deliberate on the recommendations before suggesting a proposal. That's, that's the timeline that we're seeing generally. So a decision on a facility would have to be made in April. Is that is that correct, uh, or were we, or can it be in May, board meeting? We would encourage you to make a to take board action in April still to allow our team, our consultants, to develop with you the review and comment and submit it. Get that into the grist mill. You still have until Mike knows the exact date, but I'll just say mid-May, 74 days prior, um, to officially pass a resolution that calls the election. And that's really the point kind of of no return of moving ahead with the vote. Um, and, and at that time, we could even make modifications if we needed to slight amendments to the review and comment. We just want to get in there and get our place in line because they very much deal in a linear first come first serve basis down there. So the sooner we can get your place in line, the better at MDE. Um, I want to ask something to you, Gary, because you've worked on a lot of different projects with this and based on the review of our current facilities, what would be the recommendation on repairing versus building new based on the costs at this time? Well, looking at the two school buildings you're using currently, um, the Winthrop, the middle, middle high school building, certainly has the most needs. It's got the oldest portions. Um, and not only in terms of infrastructure and repairs, but in terms of educational adequacy and, and types of learning spaces that, that you need for the kinds of programs that GFW has been bringing to bear and offering, which is awesome, but you don't have the right spaces to match up optim optimally to those. And it would be so expensive to adapt what you have to fit that. On the other hand, your elementary school over in Gibbon is in, in decent shape. Um, it does have some roof needs as have been documented. Um, it probably has some HVAC upgrades that certainly would need to be dealt with over time. Um, we know that you have water issues in that lower level in the spring quite often. Um, dealing with that might be a priority, but from a school building, especially to provide pre-K four that the plan is, um, I, I think it can continue on serving you quite well if, you know, if the idea is to keep the cost down to go to the voters with the 512, 
I mean, I think ultimately a district like yourselves and like Maple River and a lot of districts that are under 900 kids total find that optimally one, a single campus and a single pre-K-12 campus does work the best uh, from an operational standpoint long-term. And I think that would be your master plan goal, whether you can get all that done uh, cost-wise I don't know. We'll see what the survey says for that. But I think you should be prepared to try to replace the 512 at least and maybe just minimal investment in the Gibbon School Building, the elementary, to keep that chugging along for a while. Jeff? Other questions for us? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Mike, I just sent a, I just sent something out to, on the chat, but realizing that maybe not all the board members are on the chat. So, uh, to follow up what Gary was asking, the ideal submittal date for an August election is uh, between April twenty first and May fifteenth of two thousand twenty two, and the resolution calling for the election two weeks after that. So. Uh, May 27th, 2022, all the paperwork has to be into the county auditors, Secretary of State, and MDE. Thanks, Mike. I knew you'd have that. Okay. And can you share the difference? I, it's on the chat, too, so it should be recorded. Okay. Can you share the difference between those two things, review, what review and comment is, and, and the um, and the decision being made, and, and if one can happen before the other? Like, at what time can the board... What's the last drop dead date for the board <laughs> to say yes or no? So the so you so the review and comment is that packet of information that is put together answering the five or six questions that the state makes every school district submit in order to approve or disapprove uh, a school voter package. Uh, you also would have to approve it if you had other projects uh, in generally over two million dollars per site. Uh, the resolution calling for the election is just that, a resolution that sets forth your polling places, the type of question you're asking, and all the pertinent information subject to the election. So they're two separate documents, but the <laughs> resolution calling for the election could be done at the exact same time as the board gives permission to submit the review and comment packet to uh, MDE. Can you submit review and comment and still change your mind in May a little bit later? You could, um, I'll just chime in. I have worked with districts that have said just what I recommended, let's get ourselves in line at MDE, let's submit a review and comment and let's submit a not to exceed number. And we might later go back to MDE with a one page modification that says, amend our proposal uh, to say X dollars instead of Y dollars now that we have, you know, passed the resolution. The resolution is the legal binding because that includes the actual ballot question that will be in front of voters at the polls uh, with describing the overview of the project and the dollar amount of the bond that you're asking taxpayers to approve or voters, voters to approve, which taxpayers pay. Steve and uh, um, Michael Hart and anybody else who want to jump in on this, um, can you speak about MDE's perspective on a facilities project like this um, in terms of fixing versus replacing and kind of those thresholds and things that they look for? Um, sure. Thank you, um, Mr. Superintendent. Um, as part of the review and comment process, um, you'll be laying out, um, you know, what what your plan is, whether it's building new or, or renovating existing facilities. And generally speaking, the MDE or the Minnesota Department of Education um, says that if if uh, renovating a, a building um, would cost sixty percent of what it would cost to build new, they would recommend to build new. And, and not put those dollars into fixing up an old facility.
Thank you very much. We ran into that exact uh, situation nearby in Red Rock Central in Lamberton, stored in Jefferson, and Sanborn. And uh, we had to demonstrate, and we did demonstrate to the Department of Ed that what it would take to try to fix up what was there in Lamberton versus the new pre-K-12. And then we were successful in MDE approving the new pre-K-12 and, and the referendum passed then. That's in design right now, that building. Other questions for our group? Yeah, Jeff, I got a couple of questions. Is there any other way that we could uh, figure out a design and uh, plan with bids and not just one company? Because it's kind of a problem we had last time. Because building costs are double, nearly double right now. So are we kind of putting the cart before the horse if we only have a few months to go when you can do a vote some other time? You know, we don't even know a plan that we're going to send out. Are you going to pay this much? We don't even know what it's going to look like. <laughs> and uh, we only well, have a few months to decide. That's a little extreme. You know. that's a, yeah. Can I, I, guess, um, really, yeah, can I chime in on that? It's gone up almost 20 million. Yeah. And that's that's quite, quite a bit. And I've been building things during this pandemic too. Right now, steel is triple, you know. So if you buy something right, if you let it catch up on like a year, it's going to be way less, you know. We're doing this at the wrong time currently because none of the product is caught up. It's still sitting in the ocean. It's not seems too like a rush so that's just my feeling yeah i guess i'm surprised i mean i know we have facilities both current and long term to deal with and do with a plan but um i think you know we have a facilities committee meeting or committee and i'd like that our facilities committee gets together or and or we that we have a work session with everybody to discuss because I think there's other data out there and other things that might drive po other possible options that are on this survey. So, I guess my question is, you know, in So team, I think there was a couple of questions there and I know a few people wanted to, to um, member Merkel had some questions, um, member Schmidt has questions and member Lee had some questions. So um, do we wanna go, go on? I just wanna make sure we don't lose any, any pieces there. Yeah, we didn't hear the last one. So um, oh. I think was there a woman speaking at the end? None of that audio came through. Right, I didn't hear it either. Member Lee had asked, had noted the cost of Red Rock Central for a pre-K-12 at about 41 million and CNR is at 70 million and is just wondering why there's a difference there. First of all, uh, because I worked on that one, they have, uh, okay, they have 400 kids, not 700 that we have to accommodate. Um, they also uh, were trying to cut their building back as tight as they could in response to not only MDE's original review of their project. They originally had MDE re, uh, re, or, uh, give a negative review to their project. We weren't on board at the time. And when they went out for votes, with a negative review or no review from MD, you've got to get a super majority of 60%. And while they got more than 50%, they could never hit higher than the low 50s and, and failed. So when we came on board, we said, we've got to go a different direction. We met with MDE. We found out what they were looking for. Um, we tightened their program 
way down. They have a lot of spaces they're going to share uh, and do do some different things. They gave up a gymnasium, so the square footage got brought down quite a bit to get their number down and get approval from MDE. And so now we're in design on that, and I'm sure they're wishing they had a couple more classrooms than they've got. We'll, they're trying to work around that, and they may actually fund some out of their general fund. But they did keep the bond amount down. Um, but I would like to say another thing on that, the board member that raised it, a concern about costs out there and, you know, this dollar amount. We're budgeting the project. This isn't a bid, but it is a budget that you'd have to be prepared for the project to cost. And all the work will be bid out to trade contractors. That's, that's how we do it. KA does not do any of the work. We're a construction manager. Um, and, and again, like, like you know, because you're in the marketplace, the board member, we're, we're trying to predict the future and maybe it'll come down. We hope it comes down and levels out. Lumber did to a degree, but, you know, we don't know for sure. And, and other costs continue to rise. So we've got to budget you in a safe harbor of where costs might be once this passes and it bids out, you know, almost more than a year from now. So that's the crystal ball that we're doing, but I'm sensitive what you're saying about the cost, but they never do seem to go down. They only go up and we've got some recent reports and research that we're getting um, on costs and from reliable resources that track that. And there's, there's, I'll probably send it to Jeff. I just saw it the other day that uh, costs are rising rampantly and not getting better. The other I thing, the other thing you, I would just, nope. oh, go ahead, oh. Gary. I was going to say one other thing no one's brought up yet, and I, maybe you want to or not, but this 70% egg to school credit is real and it's a real game changer. And the fact that it's at 70 now has benefited many districts like your own that are, that are quite dominant in egg ownership and, and taxpayer base. So I, I don't want to belittle that. And, and certainly that's in the survey, it's figured into the tax impact charts but I think you're going to find that that's going to help a lot with how uh, people perceive what you're requesting. Michael has shared something there earlier too. I think Sue is, oops. I think Sue pointed it out in her chat too, as well as um, listening to member Merkel or reacting to member Merkel's comment is that across the state, this referendum process is broken because we don't get to plan. We don't, we have to put so much preliminary effort in without dollars and without certain aspects of a planning that you cannot do until you secure the dollars and go through the specifics. So um, Cross Anderson is a member of our team, ISG with Sue in that, um, uh, you know, using the comps, using components that they've drawn from all their other experiences, uh, getting to see it from the finance side that Steve, Mike, and I get to see it in and kind of, kind of, we're kind of dealt a hand to help assist you to get to a point where you can be confident that you've developed a budget that will then lend itself to getting exactly what uh, the public wants for your and the board wants for your uh, uh, school facilities. So it, it's an imperfect process and I can appreciate that member Merkel. There's no great timing, but if you thought about your, if you thought about, if you think about the whole process, if you're going to vote in August of 22, the next six to eight months, you're going to design and build and you'll be solidifying those bids um, that within that next year, you're almost a perfect timing of when you said, hey, hopefully some of these pieces and components and products will come back to earth like steel. So that's how 
I've been conditioned to think about over the last 30 years, and maybe that'll help uh, the rest of you think about this is it's quite the process. And there's many points in time where you're, you're, you're dictating what that will be. Yeah, I think that was well said, Mike. And I think, um, you know, just as I was looking at our the numbers as far as within the general program, the reference to Red Rock Central, um, if you look at the, the cost of a, the 512 school that's proposed, so 48 to 52 million really is right in line if you think of the number of students with um, what it's uh, costing for um, Red Rock Central, what we're proposing here. So um, in that sense, when you think of that piece, uh, that, that lines up. And again, what Mike is saying, you're really a couple of years out by the time that shovel goes in the ground. And certainly if, you know, if, if uh, members have some thoughts on, have you explored this option or that option? You know, I heard that, I think Drew said, you know, I think there's other options. Um, you know, certainly we've tried to look at what what is best, um, not only immediate, but for the long term. So um, making a solid investment um, with the community's dollars. Again, um, you know, I think we've, vetted lots of different options so if you know if people have suggestions that they want to say have you thought of this or um why wasn't this considered certainly those are conversations i think we're all open to and want to be a part of so people understand how we landed at really these two potential directions and at this point we're really in a turn right or turn left as far as um how do we set the district up for long range um investment in your buildings well, and I agree with some of the board members that this is a pretty compressed timeline. But I do like the idea of the survey. I mean, let's get people, the taxpayers and the voters in the district, let's find out what they're willing to support and spend rather than coming up with 15 different plans and we find out they're not gonna support any of them. I think doing the survey sooner rather than later and then once we get that information back and have a chance to look at it, then we're in a much better position to decide, do we want to go forward? Do we want to do it in August? Do we want to do it next year? Do we not want to do it at all? At least then we have some information to, to back things up. So I'd be in favor of moving ahead with the survey at least. But, but we do have options in the survey, and I, I think our board deserves a chance to have a facilities committee meeting and or a work session to kind of go over some of the details. And because I think there's not just more options, but even with current facilities, I think we need to do that. And I mean, that's why we have a facilities committee. I mean, I'm on there and I'd like to get one organized to go over to do this um, before we send out a survey is my thought. I agree. When does the survey need to go out at the latest? Well, again, if we work backwards, that we wanted to get you results um, in, you know, mid early to mid April, um, we wanted that survey open most of the month of March. So, you know, if your group wants to meet early next week sometime, I don't, I, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but. Um, if you want to kind of move through um, and feel like we've, we've got other pieces that a facilities committee wants to look at and you want to stay on this timeline, then I would say, um, you know, by the end of next week or early that first week of March, we want this um, moving through the printing and mailing process. So all of those things take time, right, to the printer, to the post office. Believe it or not, the, we don't control the USPS of getting it in the mail. Um, there's other things we'll do to deploy this from an online standpoint. So all of that, um, just we, you know, we have to back up from if we think of that May 1st date of when um, you'd want to review and comment um, in to leave your August election um, option on the table. So you always begin with the end in mind, but those pieces. So you've got a, a, about a week of wiggle room, um, but I think it's important that um, everybody goes, yep, these, these really are 
what we believe are our best options for the district moving forward. It's unhelpful to put a survey out if um, there's people in the community saying, there's lots of other options, they're just not giving them to you. So um, I think we need to make sure we, we understand what else people are thinking is out there and why or why not um, that that's, uh, you know, is or is not an option. Well, I also think that this is a time that if there's other options that you believe that there should be, or you have a team of people that have done, Sue, you've done two to 300 of these things, right? Something mm -hmm. crazy. At like least, that. yeah. Everybody probably on our call has, certainly. Everyone, yeah. here, everyone here has done probably 100 plus uh, projects. And so they've worked through a lot of these different processes and a lot of questions. So they could probably take a question from you right now if you have some and let you know how that may or may not impact some different pieces. So, for example, uh, building schools in certain locations or breaking them up or doing this or that. Those are all things I know that we met and talked about. And we had what about eight, 17, 18 of us kind of talking through these different pieces. I know you've been talking with the Department of Education because um, the review and comment is an important piece. We've examined all of the research from the last two referendums. Um, so there's a lot of pieces there. So if there is a question, I think the folks on the call right now could probably help answer that if you'd like to ask it. Well, I have a question. <laughs> I'm just going to wait. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so in uh, neighboring cities and districts, uh, Springfield, Cedar Mountain, and then our levy that we had just last, this last levy that was passed. <clears throat> Where do these tax numbers come from? Because on all those situations, it was double. In New Ulm, it was over a third higher. So why don't we ask the county what we're gonna pay? You know, <clears throat> where do these numbers come from? They're always wrong though. Like <laughs> they're always half. <laughs> you know, I figured out what this, this will cost the average farm $50,000, you know, over the lifetime. They'll send your kids to college, you know. So it's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, if I can, if I can take that, and Stephen, Mike, if you want to add uh, on on the operating levy side and on the bond side, we request uh, the actual parcel identification uh, for each parcel that you, you the tax you have taxpayers for. Re we request from the county the exact data, they turn that over uh, to us as a member, as a piece of that tax base. And then we calculate the impact on each parcel and make that available through a website tax calculator uh, for you. So the cost would be, okay, it's gonna be X amount of payment a year divided by your tax base. And then that is then brought down to the level of each parcel. So uh, we should be pretty darn exact uh, for the known entities or tax taxable effort that you'll be able to put forward. So that's where ours come from. The couple uh, neighbors that you mentioned were not some of the ones I was involved in. So I can't specifically say, remember Merkel, how those were calculated. I guess I don't see a harm in a survey. And I do want to know what the communities want, and what they will support. So I don't think that this means we're doing anything just by sending this out. But I do want to know what the communities want. Oh, that would be correct. There is zero action associated with the survey. Um, it's just a, a play to get some data um, and then have, a, have some time to go through that data and then make some decisions from there or adjustments or pivots. Um, if I'm correct, when you <clears throat> when you lock this in and everything, our taxes stay the same all the way through that 20 years or 25. We pay that, say on the 55 million, we pay 386. Unless the egg to tax goes away. <laughs> That's not what I'm looking at. What I'm looking at is that it's staying there the whole time. You want to laugh at that, then say, wait, wait two years and let land go up to 10,000 and then pay it on that. You know, it's you can look at it any way you want. <laughs> they might come back to a point. They're not going to come back to where they were. Yeah, it was at it was at fifty million last time, and they didn't do yeah, it. Yeah, but the costs are triple right now. 
Um, Mike, Steve, and Mike you, and Gary, you can probably best answer to help us with that. On the locking in of the price, uh, one of the questions was, does that stay steady over the course of that time? I think the second question was just about projects in general and timing. Gary, you had mentioned stuff around uh, schools that are going out. I know a few, but you had mentioned that there's a little bit of a log jam there. Can you guys speak to that a little bit so the board has some more information? I can start with the first piece of that in terms of the tax impact of this. As Mike Holheisel had said, you know, we calculate this based upon the broader tax base and the expected payment. The numbers in that survey are based upon a 29 year payback of the, the bond issue. Um, and what happens is once that tax is levied, the payments are fixed and locked in and they will not change unless the board would take action. And really the only time you take action would be to refinance that to lower the payment, which would happen maybe several years down the road if interest rates allow for that. So those are fixed. And so the payment level is gonna stay the same the whole time. Your tax base is gonna change in terms of growth. And so what might happen for, you know, I know there was a reference there in terms of the, the uh, value of land increasing or decreasing, you know, more than 70% of your tax base is in land, agricultural land. If that all grows equally, the, the, the payment stays the same and it's gonna be spread out. Um, you know, so tax rates would actually go down and you'd be paying, if it all grew equally, all of your tax base, you'd still be paying the same dollar amount. Now over time, different properties go up or go down um, compared to, to each other. And sometimes residential properties going up faster or agricultural land is going up or down. And so the tax base shifts uh, based upon that, but it is fixed. Once you have the authority via uh, a successful bond referendum, we would go through the process of selling those bonds. The, the interest rates are fixed at that time and the, the payment is fixed throughout the life of the bond at that time. And the district receives the, 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 um, the, the money uh, into the funds that uh, creates the project budget. And then it's up to Gary and his team and the design and, uh, to make sure that they're developing a project that fits within that amount of money uh, that's set out with the bond. I'm not against the survey. I'm just, uh, when there's on there, I would just, you know, there's data out there that I know that's been collected and gone through many of years and stuff like that. And I think when you start putting options that we need to, you know, use some of that data to support why we chose or why we're putting on that option to, to do that. So, um, and, I, and that's where I like the facilities committee or a work session to go over. On the question of going in August or the, the load that might be coming to MDE, and, and maybe Mike and Michael can chime in as they're probably aware of other districts, but we're working directly with three that are going in August, you know, throughout the state, if you will. And tonight, one of my coworkers is in Lesseur Henderson is their, their plan to go August 9th. They were contemplating what, what their options would look like tonight on potentially a new elementary school, replace Park Elementary. Um, also, Mankato is thinking about August. My point was a lot of districts that wanted to go even last year pulled away from going out to the voters because of the COVID and all the disruption. And there's a lot of pent up, you know, demand still for facilities and getting out to the voters this year in 2022. Um, I'm only working with one district that's going to actually wait till November. And that's because one of their questions will be a levy, so they have to go in November. But almost everybody wants to go in August on primary date. They took away because of redistricting the April and May candidates this year. So that pushed everything pretty much to August or November. And most districts, if they don't have to, do not want to collide with the November election just because of the uh, circus element, if you will, and the, and the 
crowd it might draw that might not even be there because of the school's particular issue and be there for other issues and, and not serve the school vote well. So that's why August is very popular. And Mike Hoheisel, you're probably working with a number of districts that I don't even know about, but are also going in August or, or Michael as well. And there's no other dates to go out this coming year, correct? It's August, November or nothing, correct? Correct, correct. Uh, in every, in a year ending in two, so every decade when redistricting happens, Minnesota goes under a blackout law. Thus why we're down to two remaining election dates versus five. One thing I think the survey could provide us is that it gets us some data points for now. We can come back and revisit those data points and we can still make pivots and adjustments, it's not a commitment to do anything. It's a, let's get some feedback on some options. And then once we get that data, maybe it's there. Uh, maybe it's like, you know what? I, I think in Maple River's case, they were kind of surprised what came back and they said, wow, that wasn't what we thought it was gonna be. And they moved ahead and it worked out. Um, we may get something back that says, okay, well, we just avoided doing something we shouldn't have done. Therefore, let's pivot adjust and whatever that means, that kind of means. So, um, but this would, pretty, this would give us a lot of comprehensive information, I think. And um, I, I do know, I, I, I don't know if it was mentioned about the, the egg to school credit, but there, that is, uh, as far as I know, I have not heard of anybody on either side of the legislature saying that that's something that they had any interest in going away. In fact, I think that's one of the few items that actually has bipartisan support across the legislature. <laughs> one of the maybe two things, right? So at this point, we don't have any indication that that would be going away. So do we make this an action item and approve the survey tonight or what is the board's wishes? Um, well, te technically, we can't amend to make it an agenda item, an action item at this point. Okay. Uh, so it's a feedback piece to, to get information. Um, so there is no action item. Um, you know, if, if the board is through our conversation is saying that we need to take this someplace else, we could do that. If enough of our board members are feeling like, you know what, uh, let's go get some information, we can go ahead and we can just continue on with that it's, since it's on as an informational item. <clears throat> I'd support sending it out too. So. I feel I'm saying it's true. that we still have the ability to change or pivot or whatever, depending on what the survey comes in. Hopefully it gives us some good information. Okay. Um, that, uh, with that, then we'll go ahead and um, get some things. These are draft, so we'll get some things finalized and cleaned up a little bit more and then uh, move forward with uh, just gathering some information. I would recommend then if we're gonna do that, that we have a, we could call it, a, we can call it a work session or a special meeting. I, I think the concept is kind of the same maybe there. Um, on April um, 4th, um, we can, we, that could be a work session day and we could have this and then go, that'd be a time to go through the data. Um, there would not be any action items there, correct team? That would just be a day to go through data, discuss options, and it's a non-action meeting, correct? Sue, I can't see your head move. It's too dark where you are. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, you just, I think at that point, you just want to um, receive the information, have some conversation. Certainly, if, um, you know, you need us to have some conversation in advance while the 
survey is open, we can do that as well. Um, but our time together would really be, you know, slicing and dicing the data and having people understand, um, you know, what this particular data looks like. So I guess I would recommend a work session on April 4th, if folks were okay with that. It's a Monday in April. What time? Uh, your standard start time, 6.30, if that works for people. Uh, 6.30 on Monday, uh, the April 4th. So I have one other question. Um, yeah. If an election was held in August, is it cost compared to November? Or is it... Uh, Julie, no cost, correct? Okay. Okay, yep, okay. Yeah, zero cost. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone for being on the call tonight. I appreciate all your feedback. I know that these are always hard conversations and I just appreciate the effort everyone's put in. I appreciate the board's conversation and, and we'll get some information. We'll come back and determine if there's next, some next steps. Awesome. Thank that you. Superintendent's report. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Moving on, we've got middle school and high school and elementary principal reports in your packet. I apologize. Um, as part of my superintendent report that I wrote down that is hidden and buried inside my notes here. Um, <laughs> uh, this is just some from information. There's no action or anything like that. Um, because of the census, we are going to have to go through some redistricting. Um, and in particular, this will affect uh, Gibbon. And Julie, do you want to speak to that really quick? I talked with Sibley County of the auditors, Carolee Peterson, and we discussed that we do have to do redistricting because of the 2020 census. The sheet that I gave you, uh, the numbers written above the towns is the total numbers right now that are in um, the districts for population. S say given is 1,611. We have to have a 10% range in each district for voting purposes for population, which means it has to be between 1,782 to 2,177, which means the Winthrop district is too large. The suggestion would be, and this is up to you, um, would be to move Round Grove and Bismarck or just Bismarck. If we did that, um, if we moved Bismarck, that would make Gibbon 1,934, and that would bring Winthrop down to 2,139. If we move them both, Bismarck and Round Grove, that would make um, Gibbon 2,088 and Winthrop 1,985. With that being said, this is up to you and we need to do this at next meeting. There has to be um, a resolution to do this. Um, Mr. Keene, board member Keene, you are in Bismarck Township. You need to be in the district that you are voted for. However, that Not would sure. be going for, this says when running for uh, um, Board members shift out of the election district they represent as a result of the redrawing of election district boundaries during redistricting are not disqualified from serving for the remainder of their term, which they were elected. So you would get to finish serving as a Winthrop representative uh, for the remainder of your term. However, if you would want to go for reelection, you would then have to be in Gibbon. Uh, we are one of 11 districts in the entire state that has, that does not have at large members. So this could affect us every 10 years. So that's something you may wanna look at. That's totally up to you. You would have to redo um, our, bylaw, our bylaws 
for this GFW district if you wanted to do an at-large. That would be something totally different, but there's only 11 districts in this whole entire state, and we're one of them that do, do it the way we do it, which is fine. Um, just to let you know that this is a possibility every 10 years when they do the census. Um, Julie, can I ask a quick question about that? Just sure. for people might be wondering about this. You'd recommend, you would suggest a potentially Round Grove and or Bismarck, but does it have to be those two? Could it be a different? It county? could be any of them. I just made that suggestion well, based on their location. Sure. Pardon me. They have to touch your, the district. They, they do not. They do not. Oh, then county commissioner districts are different. Is there, there they do. do. Okay. No, I was told that they do not. But it most of the time, or ninety nine point nine percent of the time, they do. Okay. So that's that's up to you. You could even take Bernadette if you wanted to. Um, and and thank you for. But you have that. to be within the range of one thousand seven hundred eighty two to two thousand one hundred and seventy seven, and I just chose Round Grove and Bismarck because they butted up against Gibbon but that's up to you guys. We have to vote on it next meeting. Also, after we do that, we have to redo our combined polling places because that will change whichever townships that you choose um, that will change their polling places. And we get that one time that we don't have to have it in by December of the previous year to make that change because of the redistricting. Do you have any questions? I just wanted to give you this ahead of time so you have something to look at to decide what you want to do for next month because there is a timeline because then it has to go to the auditors and then it has to go to the Secretary of State and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> any questions? All righty, thanks. Does anybody have any questions about what at large means too when that was thrown out there? Uh, what some districts do is they have, um, so in, in this current example, what that could potentially look like is they have two from each city um, and then or two of each of these districts. And then an at large member would be a seventh board member. So they would be elected based on, um, they can be from anywhere. It's not specific to two, two, and two. Um, some districts have like a um, they might have three districts like this and they have one person from each and they have four at large members. So it's, it's just a different configuration. Um, um, knowing history, I, it makes a lot of sense through our consolidation process, why it was two, two, and two. This is just a different way that uh, some people do it. So that's what, that's what Julie was referencing to when having an at large member that would either, that would potentially add a seventh board member if you did that. And most boards are six and seven. I don't know that there's any fewer, I don't think I don't think we can do five persons, can we? Yeah. All right. Now that is the end. <laughs> the so super everyone, <laughs> mull it over. We're going to have to make a decision at the next meeting. So come prepared to to vote on a plan. If there is a need or a, a desire from the board for any type of work sessions in between, let us know, and we can get that together too on topics like this or other topics. Right. And it might change if they run for a school board position. So all right, we don't have our student representative here tonight. Um any other committee reports? Uh R Riverbend is currently trying to get some office space to make their programs larger. So it may take some time, but they're looking for staff and expanding some of their curriculum so they can take more students in from the area schools. So and Jeff may have more information on that, but that's kind of the gist of it right now. So yeah, I think you spoke to the most of it. So they're just kind of a planning thing right now, but it sounds like uh, students who need extra support that need to be serviced outside of a, a school like ours that might need a special all day special ed setting have an opportunity to go there. But right now there's the wait list, I think, is months long, both in here and up at uh, 
cosmos through southwest west central so um there are students that might need some extra help that currently aren't available but this should help relieve that but probably not till next school year if not moving on to the consent agenda is there anything anybody needs more information on or wants pulled out for a separate vote Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion's made, is there a second? I'll second. Motion's made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Okay, action items. First item, Superintendent Horton, free athletics and activities for students next year. Uh, thank you, Chair Keene. So we would like to offer free athletics and activities for GFW athletics and activities uh, for all of our students next school year. Uh, we have some opportunity through some fund, you know, some ESSER funding, some one-time funds that need to be used in very specific ways. And one way we can utilize that is to give our students free sports and athletics. We think this would be a great thing to give to our students and our families. Um, They've done a lot of things to help us out through the pandemic and to help our district with SOD and everything. This is something that we can offer back to them. And uh, this also could increase participation rates and get students engaged, which is actually the purpose of these funds is let's, let's get them engaged and get them involved. Our students do lots of things. They're, they, they go score a touchdown, then they go run into the, um, the um, stands and play in the band. And then they go run and jump and spike a volleyball and then they run back on the football, you know, they're doing lots of stuff. So this is just an opportunity for them, uh, for kids to get engaged and at, uh, at no price. So hopefully we see, hopefully we'd see higher engagement with students and get our even more students involved in extracurriculars. Any questions? If not, is there a motion to uh, waive the fees for athletics and activities for students during the 2022-23 school year. Is there any funds in this? Just one quick question. That I, is there any funds in this to help with um, activity buses to get from different locations to other locations within our district to help also get some students or parents might not be able to get their kids to an activity um, with this? And, I've just had that question before. So, so increased uh, our transportation opportunities maybe from our athletics uh, events or extracurricular events. Uh, we might be able to do something with that. I could definitely take a look at that to see if we could provide more opportunities. Um, I'm not sure if it would be sustainable, but if there's some need and want out there, we could take definitely take a look at it. Absolutely, we could take a look at that. And there are some beyond, there will be some additional funds beyond what the cost will be to put on the, um, uh, to cover the cost of athletics. It will still be some additional funds left over. So we might be able to do something with that. Otherwise, I'll make a motion to waive the athletics and activities for students during the 2022 to 2023 year. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion is made and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, say nine. Motion carries. The 2022-23 school calendar, we talked about it here a couple months ago. Um, I think the final proposal is in our package, correct? You want to go over the highlights or hit the high points? Yes, I can. Um, I'm just making a note here. Okay, thank you for giving me a second there. I just want to make sure I captured your uh, idea on transportation. Um, so I'm just pulling it up right now. Okay, so um, spent some time. <laughs> I spent a lot of time going through. I think I think I went through 14 drafts or something like that of the calendar and meeting with different folks, uh, trying to get different feedback. Um, I, I usually start with uh, a group of people and then I kind of expand from there, um, includes our building administrators, our union leaders, um, input from anybody I can kind of get it from to try to figure out how, what we can do. One of the big things that is changing here is there's a reduction in student days on this calendar from our past year. 
Um, I went and took a look at what some other school districts are doing for student days, and they're around the 170 mark, 169 mark is where a lot of them are. Um, so that made me feel a little more comfortable about visiting that. Um, our, as we kind of heard at the beginning of our um, meeting today through Southwest West Central, we have some things that we need to work on with our staff in terms of helping them uh, to uh, get some new practices, some new ideas. We want to give them time to do that standards work and that curriculum review process. Um, it has been a long time since we've done that, and we have uh, some work to do. We're get, starting to dig into it right now, uh, but we need some additional professional development time with our staff. Um, when we have required professional development days, we can ensure that all staff are there, are able to engage. And so um, in meeting with, with Southwest West Central and what that process would look like and our, our building leaders, and I also showed this to our union leadership and said, you know, would this, what would work for you? And we kind of went three different points. The um, days that the students are in were built into, um, you can see right before uh, winter break, we have a couple days there. So that gives the students a little bit longer winter break. The holiday falls kind of on a weird time anyway that year. You got, um, you've got some holidays that fall over the weekend. Um, so it's a little bit shorter time. So we were able to get a couple days there. And then on January 2nd, there's actually a contractual thing there. There's a federal, because, of the, the, because New Year's falls on a Sunday, the federal holiday rec is recognized on Monday, not the Friday before. So with some of our contracts, it helps us by actually having that as a professional development day. So we, we put that piece in there and that's where we thought that made sense. Um, I also talked with, um, I also took a look at, you know, where else we could put that. Um, we did build in a, uh, a spring break. Um, I will tell you just as educators, it, is, it helps a lot and you, it really helps you push through that last three, four months to have that little break there. So we have a, a couple day there at break there for the staff, but then before that we have a, uh, our other professional development days. So our students can get a, uh, our students actually get a spring break and our staff get kind of a mini spring break after we go through that curriculum review process. The goal in this would be that we would be able to hopefully order our curriculum there at March. And by making that order in March, then we might have some things uh, right when staff are maybe going home for summer so we can get the materials, time to prepare a plan and get them everything that they need. So that's kind of where those extra days went. Uh, some other changes uh, that you may want to take note of. Uh, going back to August, we've expanded our teacher induction time. So we want to make sure we're supporting our new teachers and that they have some time to onboard as well as those who are probationary in their first three years. We want to give them additional support to help them be successful and give them some of the extra things that they need. Um, moving forward into September, uh, we have the um, we have a day where just our fifth, sixth, and ninth graders are starting. So students who are new to uh, the middle school will have a chance to be there without other students in the building to help them acclimate, get comfortable, do some team building. Same thing in ninth grade. In ninth grade, you start receiving credits. The game changes a little bit, having a more an opportunity to really build uh, with those students. Um, and that's such an important year for them to have a good start. Um, the other change here is conferences. We changed how we were doing that a little bit. This was on some earlier ones you've seen where we actually have an all-day conference scheduled on uh, Thursday. Um, that's uh, an 1130 to 1130 to 730 day. And uh, so families that have different types of work schedules could come earlier in the day. Uh, those who need to come in the evening still have that opportunity. And then there would be one evening conference uh, the following. So that and graduation would be on Saturday the third. Yep, we move graduation to the third at two o'clock, which I think the board had asked for at our last meeting. That's correct. Um, those are, and then we were able to get the major holidays off throughout. So those are it's kind of the schedule in a nutshell. So, um, questions or comments. If not, I'll yeah, move this yeah, go I'm, ahead. Go ahead. yeah, I'm concerned about lowering the student days. I understand we have some curriculum stuff, but we also, I mean, taking days of learning away from current students. Um, and I just, that's a concern of mine. Um, is the staff development time going to be used properly to justify it? Um, 
that's also my concern. So, um, it, I mean, yeah, those are the concerns I have. That is uh, the reduction in student contact days may, well, I think there's a need for it now. Um, if we, we, if we do it outside the calendar days, it becomes optional for staff. And so they may or may not choose to participate. And we think it's important that they be a part of that process. But after we go through this process, it definitely could be a conversation revisit to say that, okay, we did this for a year to get caught up to where we need to be because we haven't done this for a while. We could definitely go back to that piece. Um, another thing I'd be happy to do is we're building a, one, a year and a half plan with Southwest West Central on those PD days. And so I'd be happy to bring that to share with the board. Um, if you'd like to see a little bit more about how those PD days are being used and, um, and uh, definitely, you know, get your thoughts on that. And there's some things we can do better. Always open for that feedback. What are the state, and I'm sure this has been said, so I apologize for asking again. Um, what's the state required number of days for students in school? It's uh, 165 days for students in, is it K through 11 or one through 11? K through 11. Yeah, it's, I think it's K-11. It's 165. And then um, 1,020 hours of, um, for um, high school students. And then it dips down a little bit for middle school and a little bit less for elementary. So uh, we have three days built in there. But so we are still above what the state has. Correct. Okay. Yeah, most districts build in a few extra days um, for that. Yeah, uh, before the leg state legislature passed um, e-learning as an option, um, people built in extra days for those types of things. Otherwise, um, you end up making up days later on. So that's always something we're trying to figure out and balance is um, having to make up days or sometimes districts have had to make up hours where they add time to the end of each day and they lengthen the school day to get to those hour requirements if they, if they fall into that. Um, I think the one that we remember the most was probably around 10 years ago where I think we had that really big freeze in uh, right after the winter holiday. And um, everybody got into trouble that year. I think we were off like an additional week or something after the winter break, if I remember correctly. So. I guess I kind of share the same idea with Drew that it's kind of low for the number of student days. Do we need to have such a long winter break? It's almost two full weeks. Like, could we look at adding the 21st and the 22nd back and not do staff development those two days? Because our teacher's mind's really gonna be into doing staff development right before the big break anyways. I think what would be, what we'd wanna figure out is another place to put those days if it's not at winter break. Uh, they don't have to necessarily be those days. Uh, if we move that to another place where we thought that felt better somewhere in December, November, um, or even right away there in January. Um, we tried putting in lots of different places. I think the, the key thing is we just need some time and to have the Southwest West Central come in and work with our staff and then give them dedicated time to do the work and some and time to do that. So that's what we're trying to kind of balance with that. Um, so. Yeah, I just think we're used to seeing like 173, 174 for student days. So 168 seems really low to me. Yeah, the concern I have with that is as we get lower and lower towards the bare minimum, um, there's still less flexibility, plus it looks like we're doing the minimum for our, our students. And um, as you get lower and lower, I just I have those concerns. So. Um, mm -hmm. I also have the feedback from our reader this year. year. Um, I know either has been put in the feedback that I've heard from students. Um, the difference is kind of different all around, and I'm not sure it's all that right or whatever. So, I mean, having some extra days and where we can maybe have more traditional snow days where people get excited or whatever, I just I think that part of being in Minnesota too. And, um, you know, we're if the e learning is not consistent, they're not doing um, work with people that aren't, the kids aren't getting the quality of education, whatever, then that, that's a concern I have.
Any other questions or comments? I mean, I mean, what I mean, break, else, break I, mean, I, think, I mean, I think those, those two days, days for the for the staff, staff, they, before, before they go on, before they go on, before they break, break I mean, as well. As well. I mean, I think the kids should be in class, class there as well. The, the winter break, or did you say a different thing? Yeah, yeah the winter, winter break. Huh? Yeah. I'm not, not sure that he almost two full weeks. weeks. Um, for what we're trying to do, it would be helpful to get some time there. So if students and staff were going to school on the 21st and 22nd, for example, um, I, I do think I would need to pick up at least one staff development day, like January 3rd or something like that. I mean, I, there, I'm going to need a little bit of a block, I believe in my conversations. I, I think three is ideal based on what we've said If I'll, you know, I'll, I'll work with what we, we need to do to make it work. Of course. Um, other options would be, you know, trying to do something before Thanksgiving doing a little bit bigger break there. Um, that would keep it within the same quarter. Um, so Martin and Horton, could I just offer some feedback? Principal Galetka. <laughs> oh, yep. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um, I think that just, just food for thought. Um, I think that with Drew and Marissa, I love your, your want for snow days. And I think that that's what that longer holiday break could look like. Um, I know snow is a little questionable at that time, but it allows families to have that family time around the holidays to um, engage in a longer, more vacation style break. Um, and I think that that gives our teachers a nice chunk of time together to do some continuous um, professional development. Sometimes when we have these one-off days, it's hard to dive deep um, into the work that we want to get done, the work that we've promised our teachers and all of you that we're committed to doing to increase the rigor and to support our teachers in their growth and professional development. Um, so from an administrative point of view, it would be really nice to have a couple chunks of time. And I don't have the calendar in me, I or right next to me, I apologize. But um, to have those like chunks of time together where we can have some really good time to dig in deep, whether it's with the gals that you saw earlier with our professional or our um, professional learning um, PLCs, excuse me, communities, um, or it's with Heather and Michelle with the Regional Center of Excellence. I think that both of those offer, um, those times really offer that really good time to dive in deep. So um, I just, I really want to advocate for that time from the school point of view. So thank you for listening. Any other comments? If not, I will move the calendar. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion is made and seconded to approve the calendar as presented. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, moving on, master agreement between the district and our classified staff. Superintendent, could you give the highlights? Um, I can, we, um, we have um, successfully come to an agreement with uh, Local 284, that is our um, paraprofessional group. Uh, members of that team were uh, Chair Clean, uh, Member Merkel and Member Schmidt. And um, we were able to, um, you'll see some changes in the way that we've uh, designed it. Uh, we noted that there were some opportunities for growth, and so we went through that, and the um, starting wage for our paraprofessionals is coming up significantly in this contract, so that was, that was uh, good, and that was um, welcome on both sides, so those that are coming in new are going to have a, a, a more livable wage to start with. Um, um, the total package increase, I believe, was 5.46% over, over the two years, yep. Uh, so um, in year two, what you'll see is there was a structural change to the actual 
um, table and how they get paid. Um, and both sides agree that that would be good for the local 284 group. So um, I think our team recommends that this is what we what we approve tonight. And the union has voted to approve the contract, correct? They have approved and signed it. That is correct. Yep. So this would be the final action on that. Any questions on the certified contract or classified contract? I'm sorry. And that is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motions made and seconded to approve um, the contract. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion, motion carries. Sure. Next item up on our list is the termination of a continuing contract teacher. Um, whereas on January 12th, 2022, employee A was properly served a notice of proposed immediate discharge pursuant to Minnesota statute 122A.40, subdivision 7 and subdivision 13. And whereas employee has not requested a hearing within the statutory deadline and has thus acquiesced to termination of employment. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District 2365 that employee A is hereby immediately discharged from employment as a continuing contract teacher pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 122A.40, subdivision set 13 as set forth in notice of proposed immediate discharge served on employee A. And I would move the adoption of the resolution. Is there a second? Motions made and second. Julie, would you call the roll? Krocknick. Yes. <clears throat> Merkel. Yes. Keen. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Haas. Yes. Lee. No. Five to one vote and resolution is adopted. Uh, the last item on the agenda is donations. We have a, a donation from Blackbaud Ecolab Giving Fund of $120. It's an employee, anonymous employee donation with no restrictions. Whereas Minnesota Statute 465.03 requires the school district to accept donations. And whereas acceptance of the donations according with the donor's terms is in the best interest of the schools, now therefore be it resolved that GFW schools um, does accept the below described donation from said organizations in accordance with the terms set forth. Be it further resolved that GFW wishes to extend grateful appreciation to the individual for the donation. I will move the resolution. Is there a second? I'll second. Motions made and seconded to approve it. Julie, would you call the roll? Lee. Yes. Oz. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Keen. Yes. Merkel. Yes. Procknick. Yes. Thank you. Resolution passes. Is there anything else to regularly come before the board? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. I'll second. Motion is made and second to adjourn. All in favor, raise your hand. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. I did.